I think this is our first event I've got to do without a mask. It feels weird. I keep thinking. <laughs> weird. Man, when, um, when Anthony was talking about the night cyclist, he said sous chef. And I was thinking, my first thought was, what's a sous chef? <laughs> because when I wrote that story, I know a lot about cycling. I'm always traveling all around the place, but I don't know nothing about kitchens. Um, I used to be a, actually, when I was 16, I was a dishwasher at a seafood joint. And that was one of my best jobs I ever had because I could eat the leftovers, you know, oh, and when it came oh. through. And that was the, that's so good. Like it, the first night, too, I was cut off where the customers had bit. But, you know, I think, I think you had to, you know, <laughs> didn't always have time. But I, I was working with the grad, the grad class right there in a workshop when I wrote that story. And I gave it, I, I gave it to them. I always like to give um, students a chance to get revenge on me, you know, because I'm, I'm mean to their story. So when I give them my stuff, they can just give it right back to me, like what should happen, I think. And I gave them that story, and they had a lot to tell me about how kitchens work. And, <laughs> and they, they told me that, um, like, chefs at hotels and restaurants, I don't know, they um, carry their knives in a roll, like a leather roll or something. That blew me away. I was like, I gotta use that. And they told me all kinds of chef cooking, cooking stuff, you know? Um, and so really, I mean, my name is on that story, but I feel like it should be that class, too, which is like eight people, which make for it. Cluttered title page, I think. Um, <laughs> um, and you know, as an example of, like, I, I always feel like I eat like a um, second grader at a concession stand, you know? <laughs> I, actually, they're delivering me some chicken strips right after this reading. You know? so, <laughs> man, do y'all have stickers like this on your iPad case? <laughs> <laughs> This is my first time I'm ever going to try to read from an iPad. Um, I'm currently reading, let's see, this iPad is new to me also. <laughs> this should be fun. Um, I'm currently reading Proofs for Don't Fear the Reaper, which is now out in February of 23. And so that's like I'm carrying around 464 pages, I think, in my bag. I didn't need to carry around like 50 pages of stories. And so I'm on my iPad. Maybe this will work. You know, I have high hopes, anyways. <laughs> I do like that. I don't have my glasses with me. That's quite fun. And also, you know, the pandemic has been going two years. Before then, I was just like never wheels down. I was always going from place to place, you know, doing the, doing this kind of thing. But that all shut down, and it shut down, and I moved houses once or twice. And the result of that was that. I lost my packet of stories, you know. I mean, they'll show up like in 20 years or something, but they're going to And I'm, but that meant that last night when I was getting ready for the trip, I had to go into like my story files and look for junk, you know, because what, what did I have? And I did, I found some stuff that I didn't even know I had. I forgot I'd written, you know, and this is one of them. Um, I, what I do is I write a lot of stuff and I forget that I've written it. It's just out of my head, so I'm happy, you know. <laughs> Here's one of them. Uh, I don't know what to call it really. I just, I'm calling it right now the two walk life, but I don't know. My grandfather pulled me aside and wants to tell me that inside I had two wolves. Then he told me that, strictly speaking, there shouldn't be any wolves. Number one, he said, you're a male human, not a pregnant wolf. <laughs> Number two, how did they even get in? Number three, how do they both fit? Number four, don't they need to breathe air? He ended this grandfatherly advice session by recommending I not tell anyone this two wolf situation I was in. Because they probably wouldn't believe me anyway. And then I should seriously consider seeing a doctor and a wildlife biologist, probably in that order. <laughs> Most important, I wanted to feed these wolves, as that would just mean they needed to do their business after a few hours, since canine digestive systems are short. <laughs> then he told me that once he got drunk enough that he woke with a dead goldfish in his mouth, but that was just one animal, a dead one at that, and all he had to do was spit it out and hope nobody was hiding behind a bush to snap a picture of him. So our two conditions didn't really match up. With just a dead goldfish, he hadn't had to worry about rabies shots or heartworms, he said. And goldfish don't really howl or want to hunt down elk and sheep. And he pulled me close to say, the goldfish he'd had inside him had been dead. Remember? If I have to tell the truth, he wasn't exactly the most helpful grandfather. Still, be careful, grandson, he said at the natural end of our moment together here, pulling me by both shoulders and staring into my eyes to be sure I was listening to him. Well, either that or he was trying to peer in, see a wolf looking back at him. I wanted to snap my teeth at him just to give him a jolt, but I wasn't sure if that was me wanting to play a joke, get his goat, not that he had a goat, or if it was one of those wolves inside me wanting to go for his throat. So I just nodded, thanks, granddad. 
They watched him pull away on his cane. Not sure how he even know about my wolves in the first place. <laughs> um, it's fun, all this stuff that I forgot I had. Um, here's a story about, it's a first person story about being a pedophile. Which I don't know, I feel weird reading that one. <laughs> Um, I've got a really good, no, I'll, I'll, you know, I used to write so many um, flash fictions. Um, that was like my, it wasn't like my default setting, but I, I love writing flash fiction. That's my, not my favorite thing to do, actually. Um, novels make a lot more money than flash fiction, so I write about novels about flash fiction. I want to look about flash fiction as you can get in and get out in 30 minutes, 45 minutes, you know, and if it's junk, you throw it away and you write another one. With a novel, you might write six weeks, ten weeks. You got eighty thousand words, hundred thousand words, and you don't. Even if it's broken, you don't want to throw it away. You want to rationalize to yourself that it's working, and so you hold on to it. You believe it. You put a foot pump on it. You try to make it better, and you force it off on your friends, and you get mad at them when they tell you it sucks, and all that stuff. So, flash fiction is not in that cycle. Flash fiction either works or it doesn't work, and I really appreciate that about it. Here, here's one. Um, so much of my flash fiction too. It's, um, it's it, it. I feel like it's me being lazy because it's just stuff that happened to me. You know, it's not. It's not. It's not anything I'm making up. I and you know I say I used to write a lot of it. The reason for that was that my kids were little. They were young, so I always had bounty selected size paper towels around. And having a bounty selected size paper towels all around, what you do is you write on those. Half size sheets, you know, and that's not a flash fiction. If you're wrapping one corner to the other, you got flash fiction. And so when my kids were little, I wrote a lot of flash fiction, but now my kids are bigger than me and they're not gonna let me like wipe stuff off their mouth, you know. <laughs> Lunch. The girl I trade jokes with at the cafeteria I eat out on Mondays has a new one for me this time. Her son is gonna live with his grandpa grandmother for a while. I ask her why we're laughing in our way. Her filling tea glasses, tea first, halfway up, then the ice, which I guess is something you learn. Me sliding two pieces of pie out of one saucer like they let me do. And she says she's sending him to her mother's because this morning when she went in to wake him for school, his breath was white because she doesn't have a heater in her house. But her mother does, one of those big ones that shoots heat up through a vent in the living room. And then she nods for me to take my pie, but it's okay. At one point, a few minutes later, eating whatever I'm eating, I see a guy about 25 stand up from his table, then pull his dad. I think it's his dad anyway, but it could be his boss, I guess. But what the guy does is pull him up from his plate and arrange him into the very specific shape he needs him to be in to properly show this complicated karate movie we saw on a show last night. I just thought of maybe. Either way, his face when he slow motions through the movie is deadly serious. And he does the sound effects too. He holds his lips like he's making the sounds. And I look away, I want to fall in love with something. The first thing I see, but close my eyes instead. Know that next week, and the week after, I'll be eating in a different place. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll read you a bit from My Heart is a Chainsmoker. This is, um, I guess, to pitch My Heart is a Chainsaw. Just give me a dialogue box, I do not know. <laughs> um, Jake Daniels is a senior in high school up in Proof Rock, Idaho, 8,000 feet up the mountain. She lives and breathes slasher movies. She's always praying for a slasher to come to her town to dispense some justice. When bodies start turning up, she thinks this may be the opening beats of a slasher movie. And she's taking a history class from this guy, Mr. Holmes, who lets her write extra credit papers. And she does those extra credit papers. None of them are about history, all of them are about slashers. And here's, one, here's one of them, really short. Slasher 101. Don't feel bad, Mr. Holmes. Not everybody knows about the final girl in the slasher, but let me give you this blood pass. It's like a hall pass, just all the lights are off. First, and this goes without saying, final girls are the coolest names. Ripley, Sydney, Strode, Stretch, Connor, Crane, Cotton, even Julie James, where I know what you did last summer, has that double initials thing going on. It kind of gets your mouth addicted to saying her name. They're more than cool names, though. As you can tell by what they're called, they're also the last girl alive. But that, that only means she's last, maybe by luck and not best, when the actual reason she's last is that she is the best of us all. The reason she's final is her resolve, sir. Her will and her insistence not to die. 
She runs and falls, of course, and probably screams and cries too, but this is because she started her horror journey out bookish and timid, with good values. The home by 930, good big sister type. But of everybody in the movie, she's the one with more inside her. By which I mean at a certain point in all the running away, during all the stalking and slashing, when the bloodlettings reached a sort of crazed frenzy where the body had just fallen left, right, and in between, this final girl stands up through the heart of it all, through the fragile shell of her old self, and she goes toe to toe with this bad evil. The final girl is a hero for our time, sir. Kind of like a certain student, Principal Manx can't really prove was me, leaving that bucket of pig's blood in the rafters of the Sadie Hawkins dance. It wasn't even really pig's blood. But the best ever example of a real and actual final girl is from just before dawn, where Constance finally turns to face her mountainous hillbilly slasher, who's already carved, and carved through the rest of her friends. She's had enough. Being attacked over and over has a beat in her, it's cut away her restraints. The slasher thought he was tormenting her. He thought he was the one in charge. Wrong. He was fashioning his own death. He was building the perfect killing machine. What this final girl does is turn around, scream into his face that she's so sick of this, this is enough, that this is over. And then in a move not matched in all the years since, not even by Sidney Prescott, not even by slow motion Alice when Pamela Voorhees won't stop coming at her, not even by Jamie Lee Curtis in that long dark night of Haddonfield, Constance climbs up her slasher's front side, and because she has no weapon, because she is the weapon, she forces her hand into her slasher's mouth, down his throat, and then she reaches in deeper and comes out with his life, pulsing in her fist. To put it in conclusion, sir, final girls are the vessel we keep all our hope in. Bad guys don't just die by themselves. I mean, sometimes they need help in the form of a fury running at them, her mouth open and scream, her eyes white hot, her heart forever pure. That was weird. I read that off like Kindle, like I bought the book on Kindle. Because <laughs> I never can tell with my files, like which is the actual recent version, you know? But I know that the one that's on Kindle is probably recent. <laughs> but I must have something turned on in Kindle because it was showing me where like enough people have underlined a passage that that's like important or something. I don't know. So yeah. it was weird. <laughs> Just concerning. <laughs> Um, man, y'all, y'all probably all know this. Yeah. 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 Good. <laughs> you know, I'm on Wi-Fi here. Y'all could make a request, and I could read whatever y'all want me to read. Yeah, that'd be fun. Um, how about here's one I haven't read in forever. I hope that's still like it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in tornado country um, in West Texas, and this is a story about tornadoes. Um, I guess it's about cats, too. The, name, the title of it is The Complete Absence of Cats is Another Definition for Silence. I'm not really a cat person. You know, talking cats, I got invited to um, this local con where I live in Boulder. There's a con in Denver called Mile High Con, and I was guest of honor there a few years back. And for their like 40th, 50th, for some anniversary, they were calling in all previous guests of honor to do like this big, long two hour thing where we each get up and talk for four or five minutes. And we're supposed to kind of talk, I don't know, we're supposed to, they said do whatever you want, bring a slideshow up. And, um, and I didn't get the, I like, there must have been some subtext there that I did not cue into because um, of like, oh, there's probably 38 of us or so. I don't know, there's a lot of us. I went up there and I talked about Jason and Freddie and Michael and Slashers for four minutes, you know, which was hard to do. It's hard to only talk four minutes about your favorite things. Um, every other person that I was in line with queued up to go, they'd push that button to make the slideshow, and it was always pictures of their cat. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have cats. <laughs> All right, the complete absence of cat is another definition for silence. The tornado of my 14th year did many things. It placed Mrs. Zimmer's station wagon and Kim Stanley's lawn upside down, the antenna punted up to the base. It carefully took out each window on the east side of 12th, even the stained glass of the church. It lifted every dragon in the grocery store and then held them up for nine impossible seconds. The metal shelving sighing a relief not only to Randy Wall, walked out of the stock room by, stock room by the older bag boys. Not an egg was broken. It worked a red striped straw into the sticky black grain of the telephone pole in front of the bank. Until the straw rotted, it was a novelty to pretend you were drinking from it. Let the warmth of the flashbulb, the fact that you were alive, wash over you. 
all but two of the seniors that year had their graduation pictures taken there. The other two had their diplomas handed over to their mothers. There was no eye contact. There was nothing to say. That was all months ahead. Right then, it was still the wig store in the sky and a clean, unlikely path around the junkyard. And the Luther's Great Dane running across town on the cushion of air. And Mrs. Zimmer with her face pressed to the headliner of her station wagon. Her husband, her husband's bare legs approaching from the front door of Kim Stanley's house. Just lunch hour. He tried to explain it. It was an act of God. There wasn't a cat anywhere in the world. All the bare mannequin heads from the wig store were never recovered either. You can still find them in ditches with grass growing across their plastic scalps and in chimneys, their eyes black and knowing, falling from the sky. Their lips composed, cheeks drawn in, about to smile. Rudolph the Great Dane watching them, waiting for them, his great tail fanning the grass slowly. He doesn't remember the Luthers at all, as an Allen dog now, but the straw. Pictures of it are in the display case in the courthouse. Pictures of all of it, really, except me. And a lit cigarette the tornado, a tornado had wedged between my fingers, and my father touching down directly across from me, his hair still airborne. We stared at each other as the stained glass fell at slivers all around us, and I held the smoke in deep, deep, and then he said it. I'll pretend I didn't see that, and turned around, started picking through the rubble to what was left of our house, our town, our lives. Behind him, I smiled, took one long last drag, and then aimed it back out of the heavens. Thanks. And I remember every time the tornadoes would come, we'd have to run through the cellar, you know, and the cellar it wasn't like a basement, like with a ping pong table. It was like a little dirt hole in the ground with a concrete thing on it, you know? <laughs> and there'd always be bull, bull snakes like to live in cellars. I don't know why they live in cellars. Y'all bull snakes here in Alabama? Bull snakes. No. <laughs> and then it's not like a, I guess it's not a snake with horns. That'd be kind of scary. <laughs> All of that, that's probably how a prairie dog would design a snake, so it didn't want the holes, you know? <laughs> so, no, it's just a, it's a snake. If it bites you, you're kind of unhappy, but you're not dead, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what, you know what, my, I think, I don't know if I became a hero to my kids or just an idiot. Um, I don't know if there's a lot of difference, but um, we were driving on the back road of the ones when they were little, you know, this was back in the, about each like a size paper towel, paper towel days. And and we saw a big old snake in the room ahead of us. And they all jump up, jump up over the back of the front seat and they're saying, Dad, Dad, what is it? What is it? And I say, it's a snake. And they say, what kind? And I said, I don't know. So I eased over, dropped one time in the ditch and opened the door, held it open with this hand and grabbed the snake and held it up so they could see it. And I was so happy it wasn't a rattlesnake. <laughs> <laughs> It was just a little snake. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's one. I've never read this one out loud. I love it. Works. Um, how about I do a slightly longer one? I do. I know. I've never read. I've never. I know. I've never read this one out loud because it's um because nobody knows about it. Um, <laughs> I can't even tell you the title. It's a novel. It's already been sold, but I bet it doesn't come out until 2025, probably, because I've just got too much stuff stacked in front of it. Um, like this year, I have, I don't know if I can say the title yet. It's a, it's an aud audible only, audio only. I'm not sure exactly what the distinction is, but it's coming out in August. It was coming out in April, I think. Um, can I say the title? Yeah, yeah. Like I said, <laughs> it's probably it's it's late broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> but the question, I'll, let's see, this is East Coast time. My editor is on East Coast time. Oh, we're on Central here? Yes. Oh, so he's an hour ahead. He might be like doing something different at 8 30. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's called, it's called The Lizard with a Glass Throat. Hopefully, it's fun. I like it. Anyway, this one comes out, it doesn't have a date yet, but I suspect 2025, 2026. This is kind of a, it's, this is a prologue to it, and it's a slasher. It seems like most things I write are slashers. <laughs> this is the very, very beginning. Thanks for the ride, the hitcher says, climbing in from the sheeting rain. What's the old joke, the driver says, clocking his mirror to ease back up the speed. I ask you, no, you ask me if I'm a serial killer, and I say, no, I'm not worried about that. The chances of two serial killers randomly being the same car are through the roof, right? <laughs> Something like that, the hitcher says, taking the towel the driver's dug up from behind the seat, nodding thanks over it. 
The driver clicks his headlights from bright to normal, then back again, trying to see through the rain. More like I should ask if you know how to handle a submarine, the driver says. Biblical out there, the hitcher says, driving his seatbelt across. Belly of the whale, the driver says back. You don't listen to talk radio, do you? The hitcher asks, explaining through the blurry windshield of the road ahead of him. Maybe I do. Good, the hitcher says. Me too. Can't get enough. Or maybe I don't. Me either. Hate it. Talking to heads, pointing voices. Puts me on my meds. <laughs> You're medicated? Not right now. Don't worry. <laughs> The driver considers this. Just to be transparent here, he finally says, and pushes his hand down alongside his seat, comes up with a chunky snub nose. I get it, the hitcher says. We're going to be a dangerous place. I don't usually do this, the driver says. Pick someone up on me. And I usually don't catch a ride when it's raining, the hitcher says. First is for both of us then. Just two killers heading west. The driver chuckles, likes that. Switches his hands on the wheel and looks over to the hitcher. Confession time, he says. My radio, my radio's on the fritz. You know any scary stories to keep us awake? Sing for my supper, the hitcher says, scooching down in the seat for a comfortable position, then straightening back up. Drop either way, man, the driver says, just easing over for a word of the rumble strip, strip on the shoulder. Am I over here or am I awake, right? I could drive if you want, the hitcher says. License is good and clean in Wyoming. Thanks, of course, but you know, I get it, yeah, the hitcher says. So, a story. The hitcher narrows his eyes to dredge the right one up. You heard the one about the guy who picks up a girl who turns out to be a ghost, he asks. You telling me I'm talking to a ghost, the driver says, very ready to throw a smile up. There's the one about the vampire coming right at night to get his dinner. The driver lifts his revolver again and makes like he's peering into the back of the cylinder, says, here I am about my silver bullets. I think that's werewolves, the hitcher says, pulling a towel that wasn't pulled before. You know about the lot loser who kept working after she was dead and ended up getting pregnant or something? Sounds like a cautionary tale, the driver says, raising his hand to shield his eyes from a bright car on the other side of the divided highway. Here's one, the hitcher says. You hear it everywhere last year or two. Everywhere like hobo camps. There's 1932, the hitcher says with a tolerant smile. Rest stops, truck stops, lock up. Tunnels when it's raining like this are under bridges. This isn't the lot loser, the one the driver asks, is disappointment nearly theatrical? Better, the hitcher says. It's one of us. Dude's looking for rides. Deal is, this bucket mouth guy gets in. After a little bit of small talk, he asks you if he'd rather be dead or missing a finger. He just asks out of nowhere, the driver says, out of the blue. Like, kind of a conversation killer, yeah. Is bucket mouth his name? The hitcher shrugs, sure. Finger, obviously, the driver says. You got ten fingers, but just one life. Easy call, especially if it's hypothetical. The thing is, the hitcher says it's not. They give you a knife or something to cut it off if you can. Then he makes you sit there while he takes it and, miming a tiny cob of corn, he eats the meat off it while you watch. Cannibalism story, the driver says, as lips peel back from his teeth in appreciation. Except this one's true, the hitcher says. It opens both his hands, presses him into the dashboard for viewing. All his fingers there are through his fingerless gloves, except the pinky on the left. The driver jerks the car over away from this, the tires thudding over the reflectors embedded in the shoulder. Then he flutters his right hand over his beating heart. Definitely awake now, he says, making himself breathe big in and out, the seatbelt tied across his chest from while he's moving around. The hitcher chuckles, his hand still pressed onto the dash. You've done this before, haven't you? And the driver says at last. The hitcher unfolds his pinky finger, waggles it. What if you really met this guy, though? The driver asks, undoing the seatbelt to reset it, guiding the stri strap back down to the buckle, having to dig and adjust to find it. No, no, what if it's you? This is how you prep me for what's about to happen. I already have my finger for the day, the hitcher says, keeping it all his own, still spread out perfect on the blue vinyl of the dash. Not me, the driver says, and brings his seatbelt hand up with the snub nose. Before the hitcher can even pull his hands from the dash to protect himself, the driver presses the barrel of the revolver, revolver against the hitcher's pinky where it connects to the hand and pulls the trigger. The sound of the cab of the car is massive, deafening, somehow bright. The driver drops the revolver to press this finger to the dash, catch it before it can fall into the floorboard. The hitcher reels away, pushing hard with his feet, his butt climbing the seat back, but then he realizes the pistol was in his lap. He fumbles it up, trying to hold it while at the same time stop his new stump from gutting blood up onto the headliner. You, 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 he says, and pulls the trigger at the driver again and again. There was only the one bullet. 
The driver lifts the still contracting finger up by thanking the hitcher for it, then inserts it neatly into his mouth, rotating it a little on insertion, getting it just how he likes it. Where are you headed, mister? He says in hitcher falsetto. What? He says back in his own voice, leaning forward over the steering wheel, the raw end of the finger still protruding from his lips. And he says, Isn't the highway to hell? He laughs and laughs about this, then sucks the finger all the way in. The hitcher fumbles at his door handle, but the lock plunger sucks down and is too round and smooth to grab. He elbows the window, but he's wearing so many layers that they pad his balloons. What are you? He screams to the driver. Bucket mouth, evidently, the driver says around a thick finger, reaching out with his own finger to readjust it. I know I don't get to like select my own name. That's not how the big machine works, but what does bucket mouth even mean? He leans forward to inspect his mouth in the rear view mirror, confirming that it's just a normal mouth. Do you, do you know what it's supposed to mean, Mr. Hitchhiker? The, hitch, the hitcher shrinks away, shaking his head no, no. And then the driver sees something in his reflection in need of attention at the base of his jaw on the right side. He leans in, angles his chin up so his fingertips can pinch up the skin tag. He tugs gently on it, then harder, longer. In careful, patient tugs, he peels his whole face off, the hitcher breathless at first, then dry heaving. Two miles deeper into the night, the driver finally finishes. All that's left of his face is muscle and fat and tendons and dripping blood, something cloudy and viscous coating it all, like the saliva of someone who's been sucking on a Vaseline lollipop. He inspects himself in the mirror again from all sides, nods that he likes this, yeah, this is good. He tosses the face he just peeled to the hitcher, who flinches away hard enough that the back of his head shatters the window out at last. The interior of the car swirls into a madhouse, burger trash and receipts and emptied out Frito bags looking around everywhere, then sucking out into the night. What are you, man? The hitcher says, weaker. More like who, sir? The driver says, unlocking the doors with his master control and then reaching across the hitcher to pop the door open, push him out now that the show's done. The hitcher hits the black top rolling, his arm cracking under him and then whipping loosely in love. His right eyebrow grinding down to a bright white that catches in the headlights of a big rig, coming on fast and unavoidable, the horn blaring what probably looks like a bag of trash. At least until it goes under the wheels and chunks up onto the tire side of the mud flaps. Alone in the front seat now, the driver eyeballs the big rig's headlights in the rear view, nods when they don't jerk left or right. Then he angles the mirror onto himself, says, Look at now. He shakes his head in wonder, then turns his radio on, comes with the Roger Miller coming through, and clicks the hard lights off, slips ahead into the darkness. And a whole lot more people die. That's all you can always like. <laughs> like every piece of a horror movie you read at the front, you can always say a whole lot of people die. <laughs> How about something? Let's see. We're going to do a Q&A here very shortly. We're going to do a Q, hopefully I do an A. <laughs> uh, Is that the novel that's coming out in 25? Probably not. We don't have a date. I would guess 24, 25, something like that. Yeah. Um, hmm. Ooh, here's an uncomfortable one. <laughs> really short. Good times. So one day you're there on the couch doing nothing pretty much, just petting your dog Sheila and shaking your head at JJ on the television. And then during a commercial for soap, you follow your arm down to see what your hand's up to. And there are your fingers rolling one of your basset hound's thick leathery nipples back and forth. Do you stop all at once or slow down? Let your hand just move back to her side like nothing's happened here? Nothing at all. And her name isn't really Sheila either, of course. Nobody would name a dog that like her anything but Cleo or Matilda. But Sheila, she's been gone now for six weeks and five days. Don't say her name out loud quietly. Okay, don't say it again. Just move your hand away from the dog slowly, all one petting motion. Any moment now. Just a little longer, maybe. Draw the curtains if you have to. <laughs> you got one called Dirty Sanchez, but I don't know. <laughs> Uh, wow, here's an old one. This one, I wrote this in, I guess I wrote it in 1998. So this is like 20 math. It's like it's like old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some, some amount of old. Uh, 
Um, the wages, an argument, thesis. At 12 years old, he was at the lake, Colorado, playing hide and seek or war or something with his brother. A lot of lots of running through the bushes, getting farther and farther away from the truck. His brother, who was three years younger than him, the shape of the part of the lake they were at was like a finger reaching into land, and all the green things grew right up to the water. He was 12 years old. He wasn't thinking anything. He was thinking maybe about his little brother, the way their hair was the same, dark and shiny and fine. It would make a ring in the sun that stayed level even when his head moved, his eyes always looking somewhere else. They were running in the trees now. He was ahead of his brother, but not by much, but enough that for a moment, when he stumbled out into tall grass and sunlight, he was alone, blinking, and he could hear them coming right out of the pages of National Geographic, manifesting first his heads balanced on long necks, and then his things driven by men on horseback, llamas. And for as long as he stood there with them streaming by, he could believe anything. Antithesis. At 14 years old, he was sitting at the breakfast table waiting for his pants to warm in the dryer. It was exactly eight days after his dad walked out of a bar and shot himself in the cab of his truck. At school, no one talked to him. He could do whatever he wanted. He started to his locker. His pants were tumbling four feet away, the only thing in this morning. His mother walked past them, past the dryer, to the porch with her first cup of coffee, then returned, waiting for him to finish his cereal in a way that he knew that's just what she was doing. When he was done, she told him her kitten had had a kitten of her own, evidently. Just one. It was on the porch. She told him twice that she couldn't do it. He nodded okay. On the porch, the kitten was still breathing. No hair, no eyes. His mom offered him the gun through the screen door, but he couldn't because it would spook the horses and he had to get to school. So he picked the kitten up with the flat bottom shovel and carried it to the burn barrels where there was a small concrete pad. It was cold. His breath hung white in front of his face. Because he was wearing basketball shorts and boots without socks, the kitten, when he slammed the cinder block down, was wet on his legs and warm, and he didn't tell any of them about it. Synthesis. At 26 years old, he was sleeping in a queen bed with his wife. He slept with his toe on her heel, the same trick he'd used with his brothers when he was young to make sure they were there. His brothers were all in different states now. He had stayed within 100 miles of home. He woke silently a little after two, and he lay there breathing until almost four, telling himself to breathe. When his wife asked him, was he okay, he told her, he told her yes the first two times, but then on the third, he didn't answer. And she sat up, and he didn't ask her if he'd ever killed anyone one drunk night with a trash can lid. But he did tell her that he had that memory, while smoke smeared around his head, in his head, of placing that person with a face in plastic under the kitchen floor of her bed house. His wife told him that she was with him all the time back then. That never could have happened. That drinking, he wouldn't have planned ahead enough to take care of everything, but there wouldn't have been a smell, something. But then, too, she said that the only reason this seemed so real to him was that this is what he does as a writer, that, that, that it was his job to anticipate all the details, all the excuses, anything that might expose the lie. And her voice coming at him across the darkness of the bed was the same as Alana's rushing past, only now they were going to. That's not really a happy one, is it? <laughs> this is, I have no memory of writing this, but it's on my hard drive. Um, <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's like, a, it's one of those stories that's just dialogue. Um, is there, this is, it's like a, a her and a me, a daughter and a dad. Um, did, any of, did any of the women, do y'all want to come read the girl part? Come on, come on. <laughs> She needs a mic. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> First letter by name. <laughs> uh, Hi, I'm Joy Mahan. Thank you very much, Joy. So you'll be her, and I'll be me. Okay. This is called Spirit Father. Dad, do you need that spear? You do not need that spear. What would you even do? No, that's me. Let's start. Let's start over. I don't know. I was like, he's already at least. You see, I'm all missing. Dad, do you need that spear? But what if I do need this spear? What would you even do with a spear? Spear things. What things? Things that need spearing. Dad! What about zombies? You'll hurt yourself. I'll hold it by the unit that's not dangerous. That's how you use a spear. 
I don't think spears are exactly legal. Not the way I'll use them. What does that even mean? It'll be illegal out there with a spear. Have you ever even thrown uh, a jab? They're different. They're the same. Spears are cool. Just because you saw one on TV? That just reminded me. Made me remember. That you're a spear person. I could be. I am. Can we unpause the show now? I could teach you how to hump with one, I mean. <laughs> that would be great. That would be wonderful. Thank you. They're good for if the apocalypse. What will we hunt? Spearable things, you know. Can't wait. Do you think they have wood or metal shafts? We're still talking about this? Survival. <laughs> and we're just gonna... They're also good for self-defense. In the apocalypse. Whenever. Whenever you happen to be carrying a spear, yeah. Which should be all the time. Are they good for ending conversations you don't want to be in? Is a conversation, <laughs> conversation a spiritual thing? I think so, yeah. yeah. No reason. In case somebody in the apocalypse pauses the show and won't stop talking. You really think there will be electricity, man? As long as there's spears, I don't care. Exactly. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> And and Anthony, I forgot one time we start Q and A. I'm gonna mess up. But does it matter? Yeah, well, maybe we got a few more minutes. Okay, yeah. I'll read y'all. I got a um. Let's see. I know Greg out here in the audience knows Laird Barron. Laird Barron calls yeah. this a um kitten kitten grenade story. <laughs> Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, here it is. So it's only gonna go to good places. <laughs> This will be the last one I read. Well, will it be? Hmm. I don't know. We'll see. I think it'll be the last one I read. Yeah, it'll be the last one I read. <laughs> so good. <laughs> hey, you know. Yeah, this is getting better. All right. Well, maybe not. Um. And yeah, y'all see, I'll think of some questions to ask me if, y'all, if you want to, of course. And then afterwards, um, I'll be signing whatever you bring up here. You know, with this hand, not this hand. Um, <laughs> the age of hasty retreats. These were the days when, if you wanted to survive, you wore a leather or canvas belt with loops spaced evenly all around it, loops made from shoestrings. You could find the shoestrings everywhere. Every husk of a person lying in the streets, all of them who hadn't been caught in the shower or doing yoga, they had some kind of footprint on them. And of course, you target the men because they have laces more often. You don't so much want the work boot kind of lace, though. They're unforgiving and can get you killed. No, what you need are the kind that will break away with a flick of your wrist. And if you're not sure, then it never hurts to go ahead and cut that loop maybe halfway through just to be sure. If it snaps too early while you're scrambling over a burnt car, Diving through a window, then so be it. Like I said, there are shoes everywhere. As for the belt itself, though, you need something wide. A general rule of thumb is that if it fits through a loop to your pants, it's not sturdy enough. And anyway, that belt's going to be carrying maybe 30 pounds of life saving for you. And asking it to do that while not pulling your pants down, tripping you up, that's maybe too much, think. The kind of belt you want that works best, it's the kind that's made not to go through the loops. Police officers are the best bet. So to avoid the inevitable creaking, you'll either have to keep them oiled or just ditch all the superhero utility pouches you're already falling in love with. The mace pepper spray, mace pepper spray, you really think the undead care about their eyes? Not that a pistol isn't a good idea, in spite of the attention it will draw, but if you get a pistol, then carry that pistol in your hand at all times. It's no good in the holster. And of course, always save one round for yourself. But since the majority of the police force went down in the first day or two, protecting and serving, you might want to check behind the seats or in the toolboxes of the pickup trucks parked around construction sites. Tool belts. They're supple, always already broken in. Just cut or chew the pouches off. Adjust the buckle so the belt rides on your hips like a real gunslinger, and you're ready. Or as soon as you poke holes, coat hangers work for the loops of shoestrings, then all that's left is to raid the pantries, crack open the cat food. It works for all the little animals except squirrels, but who's not a squirrel? No, domestics are the best bet by far. 
With a single can of cat food, you can often dry on a full load, completely recharge your belt. The zombies can't catch them, the dogs, the cats, so they're everywhere, hiding, starving, just wanting some companionship, which you can, of course, provide. And sure, let them eat if you want. It'll make them trust you, maybe even enough that you can pick them up. As for size, under 10 pounds is best. Four to five is about ideal. Next is the hard part. Working those small bodies into the loops you fashioned onto your belt. And never run a neck. What use would it be to carry around a cat or a lap dog you strangled? That'd be sick. And anyway, <laughs> zombies don't like dead flesh. Living them under their armpits is best. Granted, it leaves their hind legs free to pedal a furrow into your leg or buttocks, but there are ways around that. You can tie their feet together, of course, or just break them, whatever you're comfortable with. However, if there's blood from that break, you spoiled that cat, that puppy. Many iguanas are useless, might as well be dead as far as zombies are concerned. <laughs> Start over, do it right this time. Your life depends on it. And yes, hopefully you won't need to use these grenades you're making. But of course, in a more ideal world, the dead wouldn't be walking either, right? Right. So with a full squirming belt, you just go about living in your usual manner. And whenever it happens, and it will, that you're making your mad dash away from whatever horde you stumbled onto, and they're gaining like they always do, then all you have to do is, without breaking stride, pull on the cat or puppy by whatever your dominant hand is and splash it down onto the ground. The idea is that you want some of that blood, blood in the air. And if you've broken this pet's legs, then of course the lead zombie, there's always a runner, will be on it in a flash. It's all buried in the gore. And if you tie them together, then it's pretty much the same results. And yes, some survivors have great complicated loops that both break away and untie the pet's leg at the same time thus giving the zombies a moving but gratefully injured distraction. But these knots, all that strain, do you really want to trust your escape to whether or not you went under or over before you pulled tight? What you need, of course, is a dog or a cat that can't run, which, yes, starvation will to some degree satisfy, but most of us carry odd bits of food for the animals. Because we care about them, I don't think that's completely it, no. There's not a thank you in advance either, not really. It's more that the animals have conditioned us to feed them, or by feeding them just enough to keep them alive, we're demonstrating that we still have some tether, no matter how bloody, to the old world, to the way it was. And it would be completely dishonest to me to try to say that all of us don't hitch the belts around such that our favorite animal is at our dominant hand, the hand we most like to pet with. That connection with the palm-sized skull, a warm body, one dependent upon you, one happy that you're touching it, it can get you through a whole night of hiding around a mailbox if you need to. Though, of course, most of that situation will break. We'll start lobbing pets into the street like mortars, perhaps kissing each on the mouth before slinging it up into the sky. And then others, of course, after spinning half their belt, will slide their knees on the asphalt, unbuckle and release their dogs and cats, try to shoot them away before the horde overwhelms them. If you want to live, however, you'll empty belt after belt behind you. There's even legend of a tall man our progenitor, perhaps, who wears bandoliers across his chest, a suckling kitten dumped into each cartridge space, a bottle of milk in his pocket to keep them alive. And yes, with the cats at least, you can sling them by the tail before release if you want. The sound they make is perfect. But you have to time it just right so the cat sails over the horde's heads. And you also have to never reconsider, never stop swinging, because that's a cat will never reholster. What's sad is to have somebody return from a scavenging mission unscathed by the dead with their eye clawed out and seem to be infected. We don't have enough people for those kinds of mistakes. As for the animals, it's just not why we domesticated them. For companionship in times of leisure, sure, but in times like this, to serve us, to help us survive. They die fully aware of what their sacrifice means. They're proud to be alone and have a few feet of life. However, there are, of course, lines. The second day of the plague, when it spilled down from the airport and infected downtown, my neighbor's nine-year-old son attempted to mask his scent with a gore of a decapitated zombie. A fully, a fully effective measure for fighting the nerve, the stomach, he had both. But you don't want to let that gore come into contact with your tear ducts or any cuts you might have. Things progressed in the predictable ways after that, until my neighbor took the easy way out. Siphon the gas from his car, one more weed eater, set fire to himself and his son. Valiant, perhaps, but irresponsible as well. He didn't take into account the acetylene torch in his garage. When the flames spread there, as flames will, 
The resulting explosion came in the wall of my son's bedroom, crushing his right leg while he slept. Luckily, it's a clean break, no bone coming through the skin. But of course, pushing around in a wheelchair or shopping cart, even strapped to a dolly or pulled in a make you rickshaw, that's no way to beat a hasty retreat. And this is the age of hasty retreats. Luckily for me, though, he's small for his age, six, so I've been able to fashion a quiver of sorts for him to ride in. He sits backwards, of course, to better see and warn me about our constant pursuers. And all in all, it's not bad. I always know where he is, and as for him, he's named the animals I wear around my belt. There's Axel and Lynn and Lobby and General Tuff and Red Eye, and after his mother, Sydney. And so we scavenge on the various skirmishes that are unavoidable until it comes to pass that running ahead of some 12 or 15 zombies one afternoon, I have to wrench the belt around, jerk sideways on Sydney, and my son reaching for her the whole time, like he wants us to die here, I log her behind us. Which is, I suppose, for my son's rear view, is perhaps not as ideal as it usually is. He has to watch the lead zombie lower its mouth to the cat he named, suckle it dry. There's nothing for it. My legs are burning, my feet pounding, my front backpack lined with canned goods, and the sounds of our pursuers are more distant now. My son's slack in his quiver, like I've taught him, so as to preserve, preserve my balance. At least until a chance the zombie, one of the fast ones, breaks from whatever it had been feeding on in the doorway. And of course, Sydney was our last animal. Now it's a race, the kind where I'm pawing, trying to be sure I really have saved one round of my left hand pistol. The way I picture it is I'll find a corner up ahead, round it, slide to the stop, swing my son around and pull his forehead to mine, hold us together like that. If I do it right, if the slow's got enough powder behind it, I can hit us both with one shot. And if not, we'll be first anyway, and I'll be covering him, and we'll have done everything we can do. Except I'm wrong. There is one more thing to do, as it turns out. One last line to cross. While I'm looking for our corner, my son pulls his release strap, launches himself down in my backpack, his bad leg crunching under him, and with his weight gone, I fall forward, skid on my palms, roll over just in time to see the new lead zombie almost to him. No, I yell, reaching with my left hand with the pistol, but my shot goes wild. And my son, he looks back to me, then it's, and it's so calm, so serene. So happy to be doing this for me that it would be a travesty for me not to stand, run, keep living for him, always for him. Thank you. Hello. Hey, so I, I've heard on a, an in interview uh, you talk about uh, kind of the, the drive, maybe the compulsion to write. Uh, you're very, very prolific. Uh, I've counted 281 individual stories that you've written uh, that have been published, uh, and some of them have been published multiple times. I remember you telling a story in an interview about how uh, you, your wife even would just see you like kind of just nervous, hands, you know, kind of fidgeting when there's a story. Can you just tell us about what what this, uh, you know, about the drive you have to write that has made you so prolific? Yeah, thank you. Um, did y'all hear that? Did y'all hear that? Okay, no, no. Repeat it for the camera. Say what? Oh, repeat it for the camera, that's right. Yeah, um, why, why do I write so many stories, basically? <laughs> um, I don't know if I can repeat it all, but um, yeah, my wife, like, she noticed early on when we were together that if I didn't write at some point during the day, then I'd be sitting at a table in the dining room with my fingers just going like this, because I really, I wonder sometimes if I don't write just to keep my fingers busy, because I have really nervous fingers, and my fingers are always like chattering and doing stuff, you know, but if I'm on, I'm on a keyboard, the world makes sense. Um, another answer would be that when I'm not writing, I feel like I'm stealing air from everybody. Like, I don't deserve the air that I'm breathing, you know, because I feel like I'm here to write, and so if I'm not writing, then what am I doing, you know? Um, which I, I think it's probably... In the long run, it's probably not healthy to like gauge your worth on whether you're working, you know? But um, that's how it feels, anyway. Um, um, another reason would be that on the page, I can make things make sense. In the real world, when I go out, order stuff at Taco Bell, or do whatever I'm doing, or talk to a mechanic about these breaks, or you know, all this stuff, it doesn't make sense. I'm like, are you serious? This little thing costs $900, you know? And um, I mean, it just it does a clock. But, um, on the page, I can explain things and I can make things make sense and it feels so good. And so really, I think I retreat to the page, to the keyboard, um, because the world is, I can't make sense of the world, but I can make sense of characters and 
throwing kittens as grenades and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> it can it can work for me a little bit. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. Next question. I saw you were here first. Okay. I just wanted to know when you and Joy are going to perform again. When? <laughs> He's great. Once he had, uh, 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 I need to get that story published. Maybe it is published. I don't know. I can't remember. What I think. Maybe Greg knows since he what, counts. What was it called? Again? Spear Father. Spear Father. <laughs> well, I got, when I was going through trying to figure out what I'm going to read at this point at this event, um, I found all these stories that I probably should have submitted. I just I never can remember. I write. I just write stuff to get it out. You know, I don't write. Don't necessarily write to get published. Um, that's a neat sound. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had uh, two questions, but I'll just ask the first one. Um, I know that, I mean, I guess not to say like the obvious guy, but like Stephen King says that he writes like, tries to get a thousand pages in and he kind of lives the rest of his day uh, every day. And then it's not like Sables a lot, you know, his main character tries to write 10 pages from this part of the day, this part of the day. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you have like, you section off parts of your day, and you're like, all right, I need to get this many in. You know, is it a word page, you, your goal for the day? Um, yeah, I mean, I envy Stephen King for being able to do that, of course. He's a model for us. Oh, the question. I was supposed to read the question. Um, um, talking about, you know, Stephen King will do X number of pages a day, and he's done, he can go do his life things. They're not the writing things. Um, and do I section off my day? Do I portion things in similar ways? You know? Um, I, I wish I could say yes, that I was as grown up as Stephen King, but um, I do prefer, given the choice, to give the good part of my brain to fiction when I can. And the good part of my brain is like when I wake up. By the end of the day, that's not the good part of my brain anymore. <laughs> you know, it's all used up. Um, so ideally, like sometimes in the summer when I'm not teaching and I just have like two or three weeks to myself, um, I'll wake up and usually go for a bike ride or the gym or something. Like I always wake up with too much energy. Like I'm just vibrating, you know? And so I have to go do something physical. Then if I can get to the keyboard by 8 or 8.30, I'll usually jam through till about, I don't know, 10, I guess. And the reason for that, it's not that there's not more story to tell, it's that I found, I used to do the three-day novel contest back in the early 2000s, and um, the first time I did it, uh, um, my wife, after to whip up a whole big bowl of Franco-American spaghetti, that's my favorite, and also had like two or three cherry RCs, like two liter cherry RCDs and a whole lot of honeycombs. And I thought that was a magic formula for staying awake for a long time. You know? And now I stayed awake for, I mean, I didn't stay awake the whole 72 hours. I woke up a lot of times with like 14 pages of the letter N, you know, I just talk out on my keyboard. But um, I got to the end of a novel. I don't know, I don't know how many words, 50,000, 70,000, I don't know. But um, I didn't win the contest. I didn't get that book published. And so the next time I did that contest, I thought um, it wasn't just bad luck that I didn't write a good novel. It has to have been my process. That's what, that's what I told myself. So this time, I instead of trying to stay awake for the whole time, um, I spent the first like 30 minutes of the 72 hours making the playlist, just pulling my favorite songs in. And, and I said, all right, that's my playlist for this, um, this session. And the playlist, Turned out to be like 86, 89 minutes long, something like that. And so I'd write to that playlist until it was done, and then, then I wouldn't let myself go and do it again. I would have to go um, shoot baskets in the front yard, or go down to the gas station and walk around, see what new candy bars they got. I just do something different every time. And and I wrote a much better novel, The Long Trial of Long and Bugatti, which got published in 07, I think it was. And and what that told me was that my writing session is about an hour and a half long. That's all I can keep. I can write for ten or twelve hours straight. That's no problem. But after the first ninety minutes, I'm just producing junk. I feel like <laughs> I'm not doing good work anymore. I have to go reset somehow. And so that's what I do now. Like so, my ideal writing day, I'll write from eight thirty to ten, and then I'll probably do something for thirty minutes, and I'll come back and then do another ninety minute push until lunch. And then at lunch, I'll watch something. Usually, like I love to watch Rocket Files, the Magnum PI, or something. You know, something that. Like, um, doesn't really challenge my mind. <laughs> you know? It just makes me happy. Lots of these new happiness. And um, then I go back, and right after lunch is always really productive for me writing one. Is that if I can get an hour and a half after lunch, I can cover a lot of pages. And generally, by three or four in the afternoon, I'm getting too antsy and have to go to another bike ride or do something. You know, I'm 
But no, I don't set like I don't tell myself 10 pages a day. I do sometimes tell myself, you gotta work through this story problem, whatever the story problem is, like getting all the characters to the boat or whatever, whatever it is. And once I do that, then I feel like I'm running downhill. And when I log in the next day, I can keep running downhill. I try to leave myself on an uphill with a problem. I try to make it where the next thing is obvious that's gonna happen. And that helps a whole lot. Thank you. Oh, and the purple Halloween shirt, nice. <laughs> you appear very well traveled from the three books I've read of yours so far. Is there anywhere in the continental United States you have not been? <laughs> and the uh, lower 48, you know, I've never been to Maine actually. Uh, it's kind of weird. I don't know how I've been to Maine. <laughs> not on purpose. Um, Maine might be the only place I haven't been. Yeah, yeah, I've been all over the country. I remember one of my very first readings I ever did. This was back, she probably 2002, something like that. I went to some place in Missouri, Cape Girardeau. That's what it was, Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And they had a big, like, retaining wall around a reservoir or something. I'm not sure, a big, huge concrete wall. And there's like a 45 foot tall mural of Rush Limbaugh. And I thought, wow, this is, this is something, you know? <laughs> Um, so yeah, yeah, I have been. I feel like I've been all over the place. Um, and and I, it's always so weird to me. I keep, when I early in my career, I ended up in LA quite often. That was like a place I always ended up. And um, I would always do a carry on. I wouldn't check my bags when I went to LA. And I feel really weird without a knife in my pocket. And so in LA. The first three or three times I went, I wouldn't go into any restaurants. I don't like go through drive throughs because I knew I was going to get killed, you know? <laughs> I know this, is a, this doesn't sell in LA. I'm not part of the Chamber of Commerce with Better Business Bureau. <laughs> and all I know about LA are like things I see in movies. And it's always pretty violent, you know, <laughs> in the movies because it's fun. But, um, but then I figured out, hey, I don't have to do that. I can just, from the airport, if I go to a pawn shop, I can buy a $10 knife and I'm good to go for three days. <laughs> and, uh, so that's what I started doing. And, the problem is, a $10 knife is a $10 knife, you know? Like, I don't know if I can put all my trust in it or not. Um, I, keep, I keep wanting to, like, pioneer some service where, like, you can have little boxes that you mail ahead of yourself with a knife, you know? And so here I go, you know, like, I have three or three knives in rotation, you know? I think that would make me happy. I don't have a knife right now, but I'm, like, walking around the airport, I'm always tapping my pocket, you know? Not because I want to stab anybody. Um, <laughs> it's not that. Um, I don't know, I think I just still, like when I was 12 years old, the biggest life problem I felt I had was I knew when I grew up, I was gonna have a broadsword by Conan the Barbarian, and I couldn't figure out if it was gonna be on my waist or on my back. And I only spent so much time trying to figure out what I was gonna do. I would draw so many pictures, and I never quite figured out the, the broadsword became a pocket knife, you know? But I'm, I still feel really weird about it. So, um, so that's what I've learned from traveling the country, is that you, you can, Get stabbed, I guess. <laughs> and not stabbed back, you know? Because <laughs> locals always have the advantage because y'all can carry knives, you know? <laughs> Thank you. Um, Steve, your, your your voice is so distinct. When I, well, you know, I read a lot of your short fiction. You know, I've I've read I've read the novels, and uh, whether long or short, it is so distinct. I mean, just read a little bit and know who's I'm looking at. You know, who who who, uh, who I'm reading. Uh, how long in your career did it take you to develop uh, your distinct voice? No, that's a good question. Um, what is time the people? Oh yeah, I'm, repeat, I'm sorry. Um, how how long did it take me to um? Kind of develop or luck into my voice. You didn't say luck into. I didn't luck into. <laughs> um, yeah, my voice on the page. Anyways, um, and my voice out loud. You know, I stumbled onto a review of the audio version. No, I only get Indians actually. It's the only get Indians. And in the only get Indians, I read the dedication and also the acknowledgments. I record it myself. When the the people who called me called it ADR. What is that? What's that stand for? Yes, it's, it's, ADR additional dialogue. That's it, yeah. They call it ADR. I don't know. I'm a fiction dude, I'm a movie dude. But, um, and they told me to go into my basement and get six blankets and put them around me and whisper in my phone or talk to my phone. Damn, I'm sound, damn, and I, it took me all afternoon. Because I, I didn't have a light under there to like, look at my book with. It was complicated. <laughs> my dog doesn't help at all. <laughs> you're a mystery when you're talking to me. 
<laughs> but um, it was funny because I'm um, talking about voice. And I read a review that um, said about the narrator. Um, what's his name? I can't remember his name suddenly. He's a friend, even. Um, anyways, they said his narration, his voice acting was spot on perfect and amazing. And it is, it's super amazing. And then they said um, the bad part of the book was when I came on to read the acknowledgement. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I thought, well, that, 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 that's my voice. You know? <laughs> I can't change it. But as for what I do on the page, um, I mean, you get that, that story I read about synthesis, or thesis, antithesis, synthesis. I wrote that in 98, probably 97, I think it came out in 98, actually. Um, I don't know if that sounded different, but um, I think I've, I don't know, I mean, like all of us, our, our, writer, our writer DNA, writer DNA is like, there's so many branches behind us where it all comes, you know? Like, man, in the, the mid-90s, I was a pension file, Thomas Pension. I had to read and inhale everything I could by pension. The reason I read it for the just in what, 97, I guess, was I walked to a store in Florida to buy Mason and Dixon, which had just come out, and I had him, I put it up by the register, and the guy behind the, the bookseller said, hey, you know, there's somebody out pensioning pension, and I, like, one, I didn't slap him, that would have been, I to slap people, but, but I was like, taking it back, you know, I'm like, come on, you know, nobody out pensions pension, and I'm, you Walking over this display, and it just and so I bought it, and in two in two weeks I read both those books back to back. Well, not back to back, really on top of each other. I read Mason and Dixon in the morning, and Infinite Jest in the afternoon. You know, and I got through them both that way. And which is to say, Pynchon, um, not to claim that I'm as good as him or ten percent as good as him, but the way he moves across the page is sometimes spectacular, and I feel like that infected me and made me want to look into that when I can. You know, same way with. Philip K. Dick. Philip K. Dick's probably my favorite writer. Um, and what I like about him is not the prose. His prose, you can translate it into any, you can translate it into one language and then translate that into another language and keep going and keep going and come back to English and it's not lose anything. It's just prose is not special. You know, it's, he's one of those writers whose prose is simply a lens to look at the story up with, you know, whereas like Dean Kennedy says of John Carpenter in Halloween, 1978, that, um, Working with John Carpenter, he realized John Carpenter was using the camera to tell a story, not to record a story, you know? And I think Philip K. Dick was using prose um, in the way that Dean Kennedy says other people who are not John Carpenter use a camera. If that makes sense? And um, I, and with Philip K. Dick, what I, I feel like what I got from him was sincerity, or what I appreciate about him is sincerity, and that's what I'm always reaching for with my own work. I feel like Philip K. Dick's work was always very personal to him, and I feel like he was always trying to save his own life on the page. That um, it mattered immensely to him whether this like six times nested reality interfaced with our reality or whatever it was, you know. Um, and I, I could go on and on. I mean, Louise Erdrich, Gerald Bessemer, Stephen King, so so many writers who I, I feel like I feel like a Frankenstein. Like I just have chilled off little pieces of the wonderful things they've done and tried to. Mash them together into a snowball that I call my prose, you know. Um, but, oh, wow, um, but yeah, I, as far as like having a voice or anything, I never think of myself like that. I just think this is the only way I know how to do it, so I'm just gonna do it. You yeah. know, I just, don't know, I just can't figure out any other way to do it. Uh, I have a quick question for you, and we'll get some else. Um, yeah, so having written so many stories, uh, where to do do you find they begin normally? What is the kernel of creativity? Is it an image? Is it a scenario? Yeah, what, with a short story, what is the, where, where, where do they start? What's the kernel? Um, what's the point of origin? You know, like the arson investigator is gonna say, start right here, you know, that, that's, that's, yeah. Um, it's, not, it's not the premise, it's never the premise of the situation. Um, for a long time, I carried around with these spiral notebooks, like what, I don't know, six by, or I don't know, you know, those little mid-sized ones. And um, I never could do mole scans because they never would stay open for me. They always wanted to <laughs> show my words. But, so spirals are okay. Um, for a long time, uh, is that how you say it, mole scan? <laughs> okay. um, for a long time, I would write every story idea down in those, every snatch of dialogue that I heard or whatever. And it got to where I had this, like, um, I don't know, probably 150 of those dudes. Yeah. And, and I never went back to them. Um, 
And so a library wanted to buy my papers and I said, here, take these, I'm not using them, you know? And they, they, have, they have them all now. But the reason I didn't use them is because it's never about the idea for me. It's always about that first line, whether I hear a character or the story saying it. And I'm, it's, it's totally random. But to me, that doesn't seem to be something I can muscle onto the page. It's something I've just, it's like I have to walk out around in the world with my heart on the outside and just rub it on every handrail I can. And at some point, it makes a squeak that's a voice of a character and they speak the first line and that turns into another line, that turns into a paragraph, a scene, a section, a part, a story. And then it happens. Um, I wish it, I wish it worked different. It's not a very efficient way to do things, I don't think. But um, and walking around the world with your heart on the outside is never that comfortable, you know. But um, that's the only way I know to do it. Um, it's never about the idea. It's always about hearing that first line from me. Uh, here. Yeah. Um, hi, I was just wondering if uh, while you're writing or revising, do you um, read your work out loud to kind of see how it will flow? I don't, um, I don't like formally read it out loud. Well, I mean, I don't like have a podium in my house that I get behind every <laughs> But um, um, I, I do mutter. I never realized I muttered back in the late. 1990s and early 2000s, my wife and I were living in Shallow Water, Texas, a little big town, and our house wasn't very big, so my study had to be like one corner of the master bedroom, and that's where my desk and all my junk was, and, and I always, I like to write deep into the night if I can, and my wife would go crazy, because she says I mutter while I write, I never had any idea that I mutter while I write, but evidently I try the lines out, you know, out, out loud, um, and then when I started like jumping all over the country to do stuff everywhere, I realized that writing on planes, I have to really police myself because I'm not going to be the weird dude, you know? <laughs> um, you know, recently, not recently, it's probably, been, it's probably been about two years, actually. I was writing a story on a plane, sitting on the aisle seat, just writing my story on my laptop. This is before I had an iPad. And, and the, the gentleman beside me, he, he leans over further and further until his face is about like 14 inches from my screen. And he, and he finally looked up to me and says, you're a writer. And I said, yeah, I'm a writer. And, and then, then instead of like that being enough, he goes right back to 14 inches from my screen. And, um, and so I thought, I better, better entertain this dude. So that story, got, that story got bloody and terrible. The flight attendant came around and gave us our crackers and everything and uh, closed my laptop and ate. And he talked to me about being a writer. And I was like, yeah, you know, do this, I do that. And then... They came by and got the trash, and we gave it to him, and I had my tray back of my laptop, and he goes right back to me. That's <laughs> weird. I've never written like that before. It was really weird. <laughs> well, we got a few. I can do a few more. I don't know. We can do one more. All right. Thank you. Oh, a zombie dress. Like, I'll read the zombie story. Uh, so you didn't bring a knife. But no, you did didn't. bring a ghost face mask, right? I did. Do you have any plans? <laughs> Are you going to go through the streets you know, of Mountain Brook and just terrorize all the first people? <laughs> Sorry. You know, that, you know, the hotel I'm staying at, it's like a hamster match, you know? Like you, you go everywhere, and I think that would be a wonderful hallway system to run up and down with a ghost Yeah. yeah. And it's, I mean, I wouldn't do it with a knife, but it, it's fun. Like, one of my favorite things in the world is to um, wait until my dogs think their life is good. And, and then I put a mask, put on a mask, and hide around the corner and jump out of them, and they have a heart attack and bark and want to kill me. And that's the best thing in the world.